It's easy to say that you're committed to the team, but it's much harder to follow through. Eastside Games is all about the follow through, and that makes all the difference. The culture at ESG is inclusive and makes space for people like me with mental illness. They have created a safe, diverse, and inclusive environment to make amazing games in. ESG has such a diverse staff that celebrate each other's accomplishments and milestones all the time. People here genuinely care about the well-being of not only each other, but the world around them, and they'll take action. But people are nice and they're kind and they treat each other like humans and it's really awesome. It's a fan-based studio making games for fans and community is everything. It just gets me excited to come into work and get shit done every single day. Eastside Games. Yeah, Eastside Games is on all of our swag that you have says, you know, proudly crafted in East Vancouver. We're a Canadian company through and through, and we've done a lot of great Canadian IP with some more Canadian IP coming out, but we are looking at a global lens. That being said, uh, I have a big secret in that we're going to do the littlest hobo game any day soon, and it'll be the most Canadian collab ever done. Uh, and then I'll run for prime minister and I'll be done. <laughs> Bonjour, Lani, Jamie Lee Nindishnikaz, Flying Poster Stations named in Dinjaba. Hello, my name is Jamie Lee Reardon. I'm the Lead Institute Coordinator at Imaginative, and we're here to welcome the Building Community and Abundance Across Indigenous Networks, which is part of the Kin Theory series. Um, I will now pass over the fictitious mic to Tracy Rector to introduce herself. She is today's monitor, moderator. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Over to you, Tracy. Hey, thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tracy Rector, and I'm your moderator today. I'm calling in from the traditional homelands of the Puyallup people uh, within Coast Salish territories here in the Pacific Northwest. And um, I'm just uh, so grateful to be here with everybody and um, to partner with you, Imaginative. I am here representing Neoterra today, uh, which is a global nonprofit based in Seattle here in traditional Coast Salish territories that uplifts indigenous peoples in their land stewardship through policy and storytelling. This event is part of a series of events being produced through our Kin Theory team who are developing an indigenous media makers database to foster global community of creatives who can connect, share resources, and collaborate together. When Jamie and Imaginative offered us a chance to share space during industry days, we thought carefully about how best to use this time, and we've really enjoyed partnering with them. Over the past year, we've, um, we've helped with Kin Theory Conversations, celebrating the work of Indigenous artists, looking at resources needed to help all of us thrive, and bring together industry allies to imagine webs of support. A few years ago, we at Neotero began a conversation with Imagine Native and the Indigenous Screen Office of Canada and the Smithsonian Institute about how to approach coalition building while we each engage in building databases. Much has changed since those conversations, but this is the desire to be in conversation and create a constellation of support is still key. So it's really exciting to continue this conversation in the, this format and bring in the imaginative audience and these incredible panelists today. Um, I'd love to invite our panelists to introduce themselves by the way of sharing their pronouns, identities, where they're joining from, as well as a description of how they're presented on screen. And I'll go first as an example. Hello, my name's Tracy Rector. I identified as a mixed heritage person of Black, Choctaw, descent, Jewish, and European heritage. I go by she, her pronouns. I am joining from the traditional homelands of the Puyallup peoples. In terms of physical description, I have two braids. I have medium brown skin. I am wearing a red dress with little flowers. And my background is a scene of the Pacific Northwest coast. 
And with that, I'll pass it over to Jennifer Podemski. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Jennifer Podemski. I am um, Anishinaabe and Jewish. My mother's homeland is Muscopeding First Nation in Saskatchewan. And I'm coming to you from the homelands of the Huron Wendat in Barrie, Ontario, Canada. I go by the pronouns she, her, and I am currently physically wearing a pink sweater. And I have in my background, a beautiful piece of West Coast um, Salish art by Carrie Newman and a picture of my family, my two children and some other odds and ends that I can't identify. Um, I am very happy to be here on this incredible panel of powerhouses. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. And over to you, Amalia. Mari Mari Pulamien. My name is Amalia Cordova, and I am of Chilean and Mapuche and Diaguita ancestry and displaced living in Turtle Island, not in the homeland for historical reasons, and now by choice. And I am speaking from Piscataway territory. Uh, recognizing that the Piscataway Nation maintains relationships with the land west of the Chesapeake Bay until today. And um, I am, I go by she and her, and I am in, uh, in my house uh, in a huipil from Michoacan in Mexico. And I've got glasses and a headset and I'm uh, sitting in front of a bookshelf full of some musical instruments, a Mapuche flag, and the books that I've been needing to consult recently. And I'm very honored and thankful to be here. Thank you so much, Amalia, and to you, Jennifer. Kusio Nagad, Jennifer Lauren Dawado. Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Lauren. I'm joining you from Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the Cherokee Nation reservation area. Um, I'm in my office. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I am mixed race. I am Cherokee and I am European. Um, I am currently in my office. You can see behind me several pieces of art, all from Oklahoma native artists. I have um, some awards from my content team uh, here at the Cherokee Nation behind me. I'm wearing a black top and I wish you could see my beautiful Jamie Okuma skirt that I'm wearing as well, that I just got in the mail yesterday and had to put on today. I'm so thankful to be here and to be part of this conversation. What doll? Lucky you, you must have got online quick. <laughs> I made the deadline. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, it's so good to be present today in this way together. I'm going to start us off and uh, let's talk about creative networks for Indigenous artists. And in doing so, I'm really interested in hearing from each of you about the resources that you have been part of creating, which uplift the stories and careers of Indigenous makers. Um, including network building, uh, festival connectivity, um, production studio implementation. Um, so I'm just really uh, um, impressed with and inspired by the spaces you've created. And we'd like to invite you to each talk about this aspect of your work. Maybe we can go over to you, Jennifer, to start. Laura. Yes, I'd be happy to. Okay, so um, um, I was a journalist, um, investigative journalist um, for many years and was hired by my tribe, the Cherokee Nation, to come over here and start creating content for them. Um, I uh, learned very quickly how to turn essentially what I was doing as a journalist into documentary filmmaking. Um, and I learned from the best, Jeremy Charles and Sterling Harjo, taught me how to you know, turn those skills into documentary. And we created OCO Voices of the Cherokee People, 
which was the first endeavor by the Cherokee Nation to take out the middleman and essentially have, we are in charge of telling our own stories. And so the way that we do that is we, um, it's a 30 minute television program docu-series and we feature Cherokee Nation citizens um, and documentary style, they tell it in their own voices. Um, we have a language lesson in every episode and uh, we have a Cherokee almanac in every episode. So what we're doing with those almanacs is only using the academics um, who have studied the history as it pertains to our tribe. And so we're going to, we are able to go back and tell the history from our point of view, which has never Ever really been done before. So um, we're in our seventh season of that show. It's been very successful. We've won 13 regional Emmy awards um, over the six seasons that we have submitted. And it's very popular. We, we make it available to anyone and everyone who wants to see it. So it's streaming online at OCO, which is how we say hello in Cherokee, OCO.TV, um, as well as we broadcast on several PBS stations. Uh, here in our region and then nationwide as well. Um, so that's where I started. Then after a few years of doing that and working with the film community here in Tulsa and Oklahoma, realized that um, we needed to really support that film industry um, and the Cherokee Nation needed a little bit more support in those endeavors as well. So we created the film office this, and we rolled that out uh, two and a half years ago. Um, and so we had a five-year plan when we rolled it out two and a half years ago, and we've already gone through the whole five-year plan because there was such a demand for the services that we provide. So I'll quickly go through some of the services. We created um, Cherokee.film is our website, and we have on there databases or directories where people can put their information up for use by film and television projects. So we have a Native American crew directory, um, and it's not just Cherokee citizens, it's any citizens of, of a federally recognized tribe. Um, and then the, we have a, a Native American talent directory, as well as a historical and cultural consultancy. Um, uh, a database so that people that want to put themselves out there for the film for film producers to find them, they're easily accessible. But then we also do take one-off requests for like very serious projects who need a very serious consultant. We vet everything before we actually make, you know, a one-on-one -on -one connection with, uh, with someone in our community. And we don't do that very often. A lot of times we find ourselves kind of protecting our people and saying that, you know, this project doesn't really rise up to the level of our tribe needing to get involved with it. And that's one of the main reasons why we did create the film office was to be able to protect what our resources are being used toward. Um, and then at the, the long, there's so many, we're doing a lot of education, trying to get more in, um, more indigenous people into the film and television space. That is our mission for the film office. Um, so we have a lot of educational opportunities that we do. And then on the very far end of our five-year plan, kind of the crowning jewel of that five-year plan was to build a sound stage um, that could be utilized by Native American indigenous content creators. And so we have built that and we have it here and we are using it. Um, we, we just opened it this last spring and we've been using it internally to do some really amazing Cherokee Nation projects and to communicate during the pandemic in a way that we weren't able to because we couldn't gather. So we're doing live events where our chief can actually speak with our entire tribe um, in an event space and we can stream it out to everybody since they can't be here gathering in person. So those are some of the ways that uh, we're really trying to help um, move things along in the indigenous content. The layers are breathtaking. It's service to community, it's broad education, it's narrative shift, it's uh, not only changing the industry, but it's building a new network and a, and a new way of um, being in relationship to media making. It's incredible. Thank you. Jennifer um, Podemski, I would love to hear about um, the production spaces that you've been involved with. Okay. First, just on the topic of networks, I would like to say that, you know, just in a digital uh, way, knowing that the Fil Cherokee Film Office exists, like it's just in my digital space on my Instagram and everything, it makes me feel better, like about things, whether it's the Cherokee Film Office, there's other places like Illuminatives or 
um, now now your organization, Tracy and Amalia's, but I, I feel like networking has taken a step into a whole new direction and and means something different today. And I feel that even though I don't know you you all personally, I feel that we support each other and there's so much meaning in that support. Um, so to go backwards, um, you know, I started as an actor and did that for a long time um, in Canada with very, uh, I guess, with in a very small group. There were, there were not a lot of us 25 years ago or 30 years ago. So uh, I, in terms of the space that we existed within, I would, I would say that 30 years ago, that space was pretty small. And as I, as I sort of grew up into and through the industry, you, you realize very quickly that you're almost always the only native on any project, you know, unless it's, there's cast members and, you know, but, but even the times where there aren't cast members and you're the only native on an entire project that probably has to do with native content, um, you start to realize that there, there's a need for more spaces. So my driving force um, to become a content creator and producer and you know, writer director was to create space, more space, and to get, in, get a seat at more tables so that we could um, expand and build capacity and, you know, for a long time, there was like this feeling or sense of critical mass that it was growing and through film festivals and, you know, way back, um, I remember it being the American Indian Film Festival that was like the place that everyone wanted to go just to, just to be together and imaginative um, shortly after that. But, you know, that was what we had for a long time was physical spaces to, to connect with one another. And then we relied on those spaces to, you know, fill us up. And I know this, you know, the vocabulary of being filled up um, by your peers and by sitting around tables and, you know, talking about your common um, struggles often and, and your common stories. And the reason, you know, we all even got into this business in the first place was to address, you know, a system of erasure and, you know, the story told the wrong way, like we all had so much in common. So I think that um, being a producer was built and nurtured by those spaces because it's a very lonely place. Um, it can be a very lonely place for um, Indigenous people. So in focusing on, you know, building capacity, I started to realize, especially with the onset of a pandemic, like this, this is only very recently, that if we can't rely on the physical spaces to fill each other up, then maybe I should probably start a digital space um, to, to, you know, push, push into the, into the uh, paradigm and into the consciousness. So that's where I started the Shine Network after you know 25 years of being in the industry and 20 years of creating content and being a, f a film and television producer and writer director. Um, the Shine Network was born out of the, the absence of having those physical spaces and, and recognizing that there's a lot of potential and power in, in digital net networking that even you know, from today's conversation, I'm realizing that I need on my Shine Network website need to have a list of all the other places that people like, like the Shine Network that people can go and find out what they're doing. You know, that we are, we are not here to compete with each other. We're here to build capacity and create a much larger space. You know, it's like, it's so exciting. And, you know, when we talk about databases, um, you know, global databases for Indigenous talent, that's, that's so important. That's one of the most important things because we as creators, as content creators and the people who are like on, who are managing and running companies and creating the content, it's too much work to also be the full-time consultant and person who's giving you all the names you need. I mean, we all do that all the time. I know this. 
So it's, it's time for us to share the information, share the resources so that we can send people, all the people who ask us, you know, uh, for help and support about how to access Indigenous talent, that we have places to send them where they can, you know, find that talent. So I've already learned from this short conversation, you know, new places to send people and uh, new, new ways of thinking about networking and, and maybe thinking about it more globally because it is a digital space now and we can achieve so much more together virtually. Thank you so much for birthing forward these mutually compatible um, visions and intentions, because it truly takes all of us to leverage together our energies to make these big changes that we know are possible. Um, and you mentioned uh, both about the gathering in New York as well as global databases. And that brings me to Amalia, who I've just been you know, so in admiration of that database that you co-created and really brought forward into the world um, in many ways, champion um, for to towards this discussion today and the need for those spaces. Uh, may I ask you to speak to that? Sure, and thank you. Um, I first want to acknowledge that um, I come in to work at the Film and Video Center at the National Museum of the American Indian in New York and take up the Latin American program that was built with a lot of hands before me and as a result of a hemispheric approach. And that is, I think, the really uh, key factor, uh, the, the contribution that that festival offered the pre-existing world of indigenous film and video that center, the Film and Video Center that was created in 1979 to respond to uh, an exhibition. And that at the same time comes from the fact that the collection that that museum has is hemispheric. That was the basis and that um, the directors of the center realized that they needed to include South America, Central America, Latin America, what we call Avia Yala include it in the representation and that included filmic representations as well as speakers and artists and, and objects right so the fact that they hired people like me to bridge and bring talent and identify but also participate in the pre-existing networks in latin america so the uh, earliest continuously run indigenous film festival in latin america started in 1985 it's called the uh it's now called the International, uh, International Festival of Indigenous Pe Film and Video of Indigenous Peoples, uh, CLACPI. And it didn't begin as an indigenous run effort, like many things in Latin America. It began out of kind of a solidarity, out of the ethnographic documentary filmmakers and human rights advocates that were paying attention to what was happening in indigenous communities and gathered, but there came a point um, of protest when indigenous filmmakers are like, okay, it's time, let's move over, right? And that didn't happen until 2008 when Janet Payan, uh, also a filmmaker and inspiration woman director from Mapuche territory, and she took the helm of that festival. And that was the real moment when it really was appropriated. So even the festivals have been spaces that have had to be taken over and then reinitiated. Um, we were working in tandem with networks like the Festival of Clackpee that its particularity, I would say, is that it traveled. It wasn't set in one single location. You know, mind you, this is a continental project. So it started in Mexico, it moved to Brazil, Venezuela, Guatemala, it, it travels around, right? And it takes on a different, a different character because there's a different hosting nation every time and one thing that happened in 2004 is that the, the host was supposed to be Chile, but it was decided that the host was the Mapuche nation, right? And then we started changing that, that kind of, even the, the naming of the territory where it was hosted, it completely turned to the indigenous names. And now we have Ficualmapu and Ficmayab in, in the Mayan territory, Ficualmapu in the Mapuche territory, as kind of spin-off festivals that are now annual festivals locally but they had their, their, their initiating moment as first being hosts of this big international festival and then continuing as their own festival. So 
the way that it works in Latin America, all this to say is that it really isn't considered an industry. And I would say that industry is still a term that would probably raise eyebrows and cause some suspicion um, because the industry, the cinematic industries of Latin America um, have erased or misrepresented, you know, the existence of nations, uh, indigenous nations in, in a way that's, that's, you know, been harmful. So I think there's still a very distant relationship and there's the inevitable independent filmmaker that comes and makes a film about or in a community and really leaves nothing behind and doesn't really have a relationship to that community. So, and they go to festivals like Berlin and they go to Europe, right? So there's even competition for local attention and funds. And basically the indigenous film catalog has been neglected by these film offices and, and all these governments across Latin America broadly, I would say, very few exceptions. So it's interesting that these festivals like the Native American Film and Video Festival in New York were sometimes the first place where the filmmakers from that region came face to face with people from those film offices or people from the government or the embassy or the consulate, right? And there was an awareness of like, oh, we have indigenous film? Like, so it was that kind of gathering place, right? That allowed us to uh, sediment uh, filmography, but also biographies of these directors. A lot of the directors I work with in Latin America, you know, they don't have PR people, they don't have the the press kit, they don't have an English version. So we would take films that even weren't subtitled yet, and I would just look at them with my team and we would identify a few and we would help subtitle those films. And then that would allow them to travel in the Anglophone Indigenous Film Festival circuit. And I would say that that was one of the major contributions of that festival. So in response to sort of the wealth of this catalog that we had from having a big festival year you know, every few years in New York, we launched in 2000 Native Networks, Redes Indígenas, a bilingual website on indigenous film that we had presented, you know, screened at NMAI was basically the category. And we created pages for individual directors. We created pages for each film. And um, unfortunately, that is an effort that wasn't sustained by the Film and Video Center or by the NMAI. So it's all been taken down, uh, which is sad because we had a lot of consultative work in building these bios. They weren't downloaded from, you know, uh, the internet, uh, what is it, the, you know, the film database, uh, IMDb, right? Like oftentimes we crafted them because, you know, it was not a professional who was making a film. It was a community member. And oftentimes they were more collective portraits or they, very much wanted to make sure that there weren't such individual projects, right? That there was a, a nod to the collective nature of this. So I think also we translated Sterling Harjo's bio into Spanish. We would have Dante Serrano's bio into English. So again, we kind of created a catalog that was in English and Spanish, and then other festivals would come and pick up films or reach out directly. You know, we could, we could list the distributor or the organization, usually a community organization or a film collective was the distributor because there was there is very little distribution of Latin American indigenous film and video, period, full stop. So that was the scenario until that festival was also uh, put on indefinite hiatus. It's been 10 years since we've had that festival in New York and I really miss it. So in the meantime, other efforts pop up. Um, one thing I, I did want to note is that when I go home, from New York where I used to live, DC where I live now, I don't get asked about other native communities in Latin America. People wanna know what's happening in the film world here and in Canada, right? So I try to bring films translated into Spanish back home. And that is actually the most challenging part of the job to actually bring that filmography back. And that would be one of the things that I, I think we'll talk about later, which is, you know, what can we do to help you know, now we have these global platforms, but even then you don't necessarily have the option to subtitle into other languages. So other festivals have uh, continued at the Smithsonian Native Cinema Showcase. It was uh, created to offer indigenous contemporary film during Indian market. And fortunately that's still running and we're online beginning in a couple weeks. And we also have a new festival out of the Washington outfit here where I'm at. Um, it's the Mother Tongue Film Festival. And it's a new festival, right? And it's a festival that doesn't have this ethnic category. It's about the languages, about 
mother tongues of the world, which I find really productive and, and interesting to be able to tell these stories now without that stamp or rubric of like, come see indigenous film. Like you're gonna get indigenous film if you come here, but you don't have to necessarily even have to know about indigenous film to find it here. So that's been interesting because it's really an experiment more in a thematic curation. We find stories that link together from across the world. So it's been interesting to put all this film into dialogue and also dust off older films, you know, that maybe I didn't look at as a mother tongue film back in the day, right? So I think that that lens of sort of films and indigenous language, I think that's the next thing. I think that that's, that's the real kind of narrative sovereignty is to tell a story in your own language, right? So that's where we are now. And that's a, a new festival. We haven't been able to gain access to the metadata of the Native Networks project. It would be interesting to resurface that somehow, but it's more complicated on the inside. We're very siloed at the Smithsonian. And um, right now we have a small corpus of films from the Mother Tongue Film Festival that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to see what we could do with that body of work. But I would say it's harder to parse because it's global. Thank you so much, Amalia. Um, with all of your powerful contributions and reflections, you know, the in setting the table here for this conversation today, um, for me, what comes forward is um, that these networks bring together humans, bring together the creators, and the the power I see in so much indigenous cinema and media spaces is that kind of co-uplifting and these opportunities to be in person, to talk to one another, to support each other have really resulted in some incredible partnerships and that kind of peer-to-peer -peer conversation, mentorship, um, you know, just working together. And I'm curious um, from each of you, what are you inspired by today? How are you seeing these peer-to-peer connections shaping our realities in this moment. I can answer for myself. Yes, um, thank you. I am finding, and I don't know if it's because I'm 48 or that I just have a long, a lot, so much experience and I have gained wisdom about this work. Um, my my biggest light comes from the joy of mentoring. I just can't even, I've been thinking about it a lot lately and I can't even describe how, you know, how, how much that fills me up. I've always known it um, and I've mentored since the beginning and have always said that, you know, seeing that spark in a young person's eye when you're, when they figure out that they can do something, you know, for the first time, when you sort of help them find that spark is, is there's nothing like it, but now the mentorship is way more meaningful. And, you know, through the shine network, I guess people feel like they can just reach out more easily. And uh, yeah. So again, the reason I called it the shine network is not for it because it's a TV station, but because it's a network of women who can reach out to one another. That's my goal for it. Um, who can support each other and co-uplift, as you say. Does that answer your question? I don't even- Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Something that I find so often that has frustrated me and, um, you know, roughly doing this for 20 years is that the, the industry itself can be very individualistic and patriarchal and hierarchical. But what I'm seeing is in many of these spaces that we're part of, that that's not always the case, that there is this kind of mutual reflection, this working together, this figuring out new paths forward and mentorship is integral to that. I would, I would love to add on to that um, in saying something that inspires me um, is something Jennifer, you touched on at the very beginning of this, where you said that, you know, somehow just seeing that Cherokee Nation film office exists makes you feel better. And I would say I, there was one day, I think it was um, during reservation dogs and some other things going on where when I looked through my social media feeds, 
everything I saw was good news and it was all indigenous and native. And I was like, look at this person doing this amazing thing. Look at that person doing this amazing thing. Look at this beautiful jewelry. Like, I mean, it was just, I, I, I had a moment where I just, I just sat there and thought everything is moving in the right direction and it just made me so happy um and just to see sort of um all of the forward movement in all of these spaces um i feel like it, it's it's good for not just me and you all but like i spoke at the university of oklahoma last night to a group of um, media film and media studies students and the hope that there were there were about three or four indigenous students and that just like they had the biggest smiles on their face and they just were so hopeful and they were like, I feel like I'm coming into this at the right moment. And I'm like, you are. So I just feel like um, seeing that um, everywhere I look is, is um, really positive. Yeah, it was just a short amount, a period of time last year that the conversation around indigenous indigenous futurisms was strong and is strong, but in many ways, the future feels like it's here now that, the, that we are that seed of intention that it's flourishing. Amalia, I thought I saw you were gonna. Yeah, I, I would add that, you know, I've, I've also been super inspired by the youth that is having more access to training um, I gave a class for Ambulante Masaya, which is a Mexican outfit that tours and trains a documentary across underserved regions in Mexico, serving Afro-Indigenous, Campesino, um, all kinds of rural communities, right? And the stories that are coming out of there are amazing. And I, I, every time one of them gets a fellowship or gets a small film out or gets an award, um, it's really amazing. And that's mentorship is, uh, they call each each uh, year's group uh, generation, right? Ambulante generation one, generation two, generation three. So it's super gratifying to see that it's something that it will keep going, right? And I think sustaining uh, is really important in this effort, What, how you can sustain these efforts. Um, and I would say the second thing, I was really inspired when I went and saw a round table and was invited to be a respondent for a round table of 10 indigenous women directors of Mexico at the Morelia International Film Festival. It is not a native festival. It is a festival that's always had kind of a native forum like Sundance, but they took a look inside and said, where are the women? So when they brought them out, it was so powerful. They had to have two four hour sessions for everybody to get to speak. And that is, uh, it's, on, uh, it's on YouTube and it's there, it's out there, it's a masterclass. And then when when Angeles Cruz actually like comes out as a lesbian on stage at this event, you're like, okay, we're in a whole different place now, because <laughs> it's been there's been so many themes that have been taboo and gender and sexuality and sexual violence have been some of them. So I think that while it's hard to address these topics, it's really important that they're starting to have a platform and they're not taboo anymore. It's a little stormy here, so my Wi-Fi is off. Um, apologies for that. Um, yeah, you know, we in this moment, it's it's, it's powerful. It's these training opportunities. There's these global realities and the interconnectivity between the global south, the global north. There's these opportunities for member, you know, mentorship for access. And Jennifer Lauren, as you said, you looked at your feed and there's joy, there is positivity, there is just a wealth of um, opportunity and this amazing momentum. What are all your hopes in this moment? How do we keep the sustainability? How do we continue moving forward? I say seize the day and make the most of everything that you can. Um, I don't know how long it's gonna last. <laughs> I hope it lasts forever. Um, but um, I, I think sadly, that's where my mind goes. You know, how long is this going to last? Um, but I think, I think that 
if we can, every person can just take this moment and make the most of it. So for me, that means, okay, we've, we've gotten our five-year plan accomplished. What's my next five-year plan and how does it, how does it grow and reach out even further? And honestly, one of my major goals um, as I look forward is to connect, like we were saying, with other people who are doing a lot of the same things and saying, how can we work together? How can we um, somehow, you know, provide um, multiple spaces that rely on each other or, you know, we can send one, you know, for example, um, one of the things that our Cherokee Nation Film Office, it's been on our list to do, but we haven't quite gotten to it yet, is, you know, what do we do with our Cherokee screenwriters and helping those screenwriters to get to the next level and that sort of thing. And so, I found out about the Native American Media Alliance at the Bar Sid Foundation in Los Angeles. And um, they're specifically working on all of that screenwriting specifically for indigenous and native peoples. And so we partnered with them and I'm like, hey, you guys are doing it, you're doing it right. So we will use our resources to put our people through your programs, you know? And so I'm looking to do a lot more of those types of things. Um, because we, we can't do it all ourselves. And um, we, we have other people who are doing other things and they're doing it better than we could do it. So I feel like finding those key partnerships in indigenous communities um, and relying on each other and lifting each other up is a major part of you know where I see I'm moving forward. Thank you for that real talk. Um, because yeah, there is that voice like, wait, is this, just a moment or is this sustainable and that's absolutely a conversation it's a different way of being when you know there's this idea of leaning in and not having these restrictions or not having these limitations and i feel like we're moving in that direction that um, the work is moving in that direction, but there's still that voice. I see a lot of people who are who are working, though, to definitely keep pushing and making this not. How do I say like what we're doing now, um, pushing for more always so that it isn't just a moment, you know, so um, Rutherford Falls, for example, you know, insisting that they have a native writer's room. Um, and then, you know, that's something that you wouldn't have been able to ask for <laughs> and get, you know, on that level of a project in the past. And so normalizing that, and then also, you know, using that as a stepping stone to push for more than that. Something that I've been focused on um, for the last probably year when I've been thinking about how, what is the most effective way for me and the work at the Shine Network to, you know, a, achieve the goals of taking up space um, while celebrating and training and professional development. Um, where I see, uh, you know, where I am as a entrepreneur, a production company owner and uh, executive level uh, content creator is that that's where there's a huge absence of, of Indigenous people. And that is also one of the biggest barriers. One of our biggest barriers here in Canada is that we always have to partner with, you know, more experienced people. And that was true for me up until recently. Um, and maybe that will change soon for me. But what that means is someone who can, you know, who has a track record to get a bank loan, who has a track record to deliver content to a broadcaster and, you know, work with at, at a level where people believe that they're worth investing in and they know they'll pay the money back, basically. That is a huge barrier to us climbing up to that, the highest level. Um, content creation and crew and indigenous stories and narrative sovereignty are so important but at the at the end of the day 
if there aren't indigenous people and allies who let those indigenous people step forward and run those productions, we're never really going to be able to get to a point where we, you know, thrive economically and create that um, indigenous economy um, for ourselves. So I'm thinking of ways or not thinking, but working towards ways of, of, of maybe focusing on, you know, established creators who have the, the bandwidth and the ability and interest to an aptitude to run a production company and to understand how to keep that company, you know, afloat and grow and thrive and be sustainable so that we can start optioning all the content that all these creators are making and they don't have to go to non-Indigenous producers to have them made. I would say in the, in the case of Latin America, um, there's still a real need for professional development and professionalization. You get to be a native filmmaker, but you have to do everything. <laughs> you have to do direct, write, produce, edit, promote, you know, the whole thing, right? So um, I think that we're seeing people who are emerging now with a proficiency for sound or an interest in sound or an interest in cinematography, like that, that's been a luxury item, honestly, um, for generations of the first generations of indigenous filmmakers across Latin America. And one of the things we've kicked around at Mother Tongue, and we're trying to raise some funding for uh, when we were a live festival, of course, um, is to have um, an indigenous fellow come to the festival and be the kind of documenter, the crew, you know, to shoot B-roll, shoot a trailer of opening night, things like that. A couple deliverables that are practice-based, but get the opportunity to be in the festival from within and be able to meet the directors that we're bringing in and be able to look at how we create the festival, see how a round table is run. We had a wonderful intern from the Technological University of Auckland and, and she was Maori and we were showing a film by Bexara Hanga. Um, and so I was like, she totally has to do the intro to this film, right? And she was, you know, she did it right. And it was amazing and it just, you know, brought down the house, right? So it's kind of that, that flexibility within the institutional space as well to recognize talent when it's right in front of you, right? And I would say that in terms of the integration of Latin America, it's not about plane tickets. You know, there's a bunch of diasporic communities. Uh, in New York, I had a lot more different diasporas from Latin America at, at, as audience, as critical audience, kind of always checking you, right? But here in DC, um, there's a strong Central American community, there's a really strong Mayan community, Salvadorian, you know, and that filmography is different. And then across the river, across the Potomac, it's really strong in the Andean and Bolivian and Peruvian. So there's another kind of audience. So this uh, issue of like the, the diaspora of, of indigenous Latin America is, is also something that can be tapped. I would invite people to do that. And uh, that's where you can also find a uh, future indigenous crew, you know, future talent there. Sometimes they've come here to go to school, right? Because we don't even have uh, a wealth of film schools and in many countries, film schools are still a novelty, right? So I think opening up uh, kind of internships and fellowships within our own spaces for people to come learn and exchange is a great way to learn about each other, right? The, the person that you receive becomes an ambassador of where they're from. So that's something that we were doing at the Museum of American Indian. We had interns that always came from Indian country and from all over. So I really miss that. And it's been a challenge. I'm going to say it. It's been a challenge to find diverse interns that can navigate the Smithsonian application system. It's already very unfriendly. And I've been working on a committee about internship diversity and things like that. And it's painful. Um, but I think partnerships, I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in partnering with any kind of indigenous run university that has a film program or a journalism program, because I think that we need to create those pipelines. And, you know, again, I'm more in the educational aspect and not so much in the industrial world as you are, but I think that we play a role in that training and all of our activities and events are free. So it's a way to also get other folks in the room that can't travel or that wouldn't be accessing paid spaces. Um, and that includes a reaching out to, um, folks that have, you know, that maybe don't have language 
skills necessarily, but they they can communicate in other ways, right? So I think flexibilizing also our our own criteria of what has to be met in order to be on our team that, that's that's important. I often think about um, what we're seeing in terms of um, interns being able to you know travel and be part of. Um, different experiences, um, such as Sundance having a Pacifica identified person always as part of their team. I also think about the new co-productions that are happening that are global and how this contributes to the potential of breaking down borders as well. And I'm curious about your thoughts about co-productions and how do we begin shifting these barriers that have, um, you know, Maybe once we do break down some of these borders and boundaries, we can open up these spaces for greater learning opportunities too. I know that Wapakoni has been co-producing across Latin America. They've worked with Mapuche and with Embera in Panama and in Brazil as well. Um, and they've hosted gatherings and brought the folks up to Montreal to have their annual uh, convening. So there is a network in progress that Wapakoti has been working on and they are a member of CLACPI, of that network of uh, indigenous filmmaking across the continent. And, and it's an open invitation, you know? Uh, it's not just a Latin American network. It's always been continental. We've had participation of uh, filmmakers like Victor Masayazva, who used to go to the Clackpea festivals in Ecuador and in Mexico. So I think that that invitation is very much open and we would love to see more programmers and filmmakers from Turtle Island be uh, at the festivals. There's always a, an invitation to submit that goes out, but we don't get a lot of submissions. So, you know, so in our last 10 minutes and still thinking through this, you know, um, oper these opportunities of co-productions and how, how do we reach across borders, what can we hear in this conversation? How can we do better? How can we work together? How can we ask for these shifts and changes? Well, I think here in Canada, um, there are significant barriers uh, to things like co-productions and even, you know, knowledge sharing and resource sharing from in between communities, um, like nation to nation and that sort of thing. It's policy. It's, it's the policies that are in place that are the barrier. Um, it even exists sort of internally here. Like, I really believe that um, just on a, on a federal structure here, uh, indigenous nations across Canada should be able to work with one another on a nation to nation basis, um, accessing the same sort of uh, benefits like tax credits and things like that, um, just up here. But beyond that, I think that there should be nation to nation relationships south of the border. And, you know, to go back to that, to the <laughs> pre- pre-colonial kind of structures of trading and knowledge sharing and, and bridge building, community building, all of those things. Um, and I think, you know, we would, we would be able to see like some major growth in, in this sector and all sectors um, if, we, if we could eliminate those barriers, those policy barriers. <laughs> So um, here in Oklahoma, I haven't uh, I haven't come across I don't get a lot of talk about um, say for example Canadian film other than through my indigenous community of you know um, it comes up all the time obviously um, but when I'm working you know I work hand in hand with the state of Oklahoma and their film commission here and so um, in a way that is nation to nation, right? So um, the Cherokee nation in the state. Um, and another way that I like to, that you could take that sort of nation to nation um, idea is, you know, within our tribal nations. Um, and one thing that, that, that we're doing with our film office 
very intentionally is that um, all of our programming and all of our initiatives are not just for Cherokee Nation citizens, they're, they're for citizens of other tribes. And so um, that's one of our challenges is when we are called the Cherokee Nation Film Office, if you're not Cherokee and you're from another tribe, you might not immediately think that we have something for you. Um, and so that's one of our challenges that we're looking at here. Um, and how we, can we get over that hurdle? Because we want people to know that um, we're here for everybody because we're really trying to lift up um, the entire indigenous Native American community with the work that we're doing. That's the best way I know to answer that question. I think that nation to nation is a key approach. Um, one thing that I've been hearing from the different conversations online over the past year and a half, right, where I'm able to be at three different film festivals that are normally geographically very distant, right, but we can be together through the Zooms, um, is increasingly folks are referring to their cinema as their own nation cinema, right? So Mapuche cinema, Guarani cinema, right? Um, Kayapo cinema, Purepecha cinema. So I think that's totally possible to have a guest nation that's not a nation state, right? But to invite like a showcase of a, a different nation and, and they would be delighted to uh, participate in some kind of way like that. And I think that right now the, there is enough production so that various nations could create a sort of showcase or selection for you. Thank you. Well, we are starting to get some questions from the audience and maybe we can shift a little early from this discussion and start answering some audience questions if you're up for it. All right. Um, so one of the questions that came in is um, why this moment? Why are things changing so drastically? It's a big one. I can start. So I, I, I think that um, people have been chipping away at this for so long. So I, you know, my film office wouldn't even exist or have been an idea without the work of so many people um, that were working in this space before me. Um, and so I think that they laid the groundwork and then um, politically, you know, the tides have turned in the United States, obviously. And we have a administration that is supportive of native issues and it trickles down um, and I just feel like when my nation, uh, Cherokee Nation, is healthier from the top down, I mean, it really has a difference on everything that's happening underneath my tribe. And so I am able to offer programming that um, I'm able to offer because our nation is healthier now than we have been in a long time. Um, we have a long ways to go, but I feel like our, we're not alone in that. And I feel like there's progress being made in a lot of um indigenous administrations and um, throughout Indian country. Um, and I think that's just probably just one of the one of the reasons in my book that um, that we're seeing what's happening in this moment um, continue. Does anybody agree disagree or <laughs> I, I agree. Um, in addition to that, I think that there's a lot of factors. like I think this moment has happened many times and it goes back to what jennifer was saying about like how long will this last kind of thing and i think that's why she said that is because this moment has happened before many times and there but there are di uh, factors that were never up included in the past like social media um a pandemic where people are you know sort of forced to face uh things that maybe they they weren't they didn't have time for before one of them being you know the movement of indigenous uh rights and issues but also all of the things that are happening in our communities and the the you know residential the the light being shone on the residential school 
legacy. Um, it's just undeniable. People cannot ignore it anymore. But I also think that this is, it's not about um, necessarily why now, it's more about like, how do we make this last? <laughs> Because there have been many moments I've seen in my in my only my career of 25 years or whatever, 30 years, there's there have been a good bunch of moments like this, where you just thought, oh, we could finally just grow from here. The seeds have been planted and now we will, you know, have this rich harvest. I completely agree, Jennifer, and it's the double pandemic, right? It's, it's this uh, arising that's happened all over uh, civil society protesting these systems. And uh, in, in Latin America, I would say there's a before and after of the Aymara president of Bolivia, you know, who proved to Latin America and the world that you can't have an indigenous presidency and an intercultural cabinet. And, you know, that didn't end well, but history will say, you know, and it's definitely had an impact and secured many things and the writing in of constitutional rights of Mother Earth in the constitutions of Ecuador, of Bolivia, and the constant protest, you know, that, that indigenous communities take to the streets, they make themselves heard all across the continent. In October 2019, we had a civic uprising in Chile. It was a huge uprising that wasn't politically led. It was many movements altogether. Started with students jumping the turnstile because the fare got raised a few cents. And it ended up in mayhem and it really forced the country, which had been in a pendulum of the same presidents going back and forth, uh, left and right. And it forced the conversation, you know, the elephant in the room to finally take shape, which is the rewriting of a constitution. So a constituency, you know, came together, elected delegates to be on the constitutional committee, ended up electing 19 indigenous members. I mean, there was a, there was reserved slots, but there were also other people. And then that constitutional assembly, the people who are going to rewrite the constitution, elected a Mapuche woman linguist to be the president of that committee. So these are important changes. These are heavy changes. These are going to be significant. And it is about legitimacy and value of these knowledges and of those histories. And this is forcing big conversations, big, difficult conversations to happen. And that's why I think is, is a, that's another contributing factor. Like people now need an explanation. People now need to go get their education belatedly. And that's when there's more thirst for that first person's story and to learn more about the history. And, and at least in Latin America, uh, a lot of the filmmaking is about correctives, about issuing accurate storytelling in the light of historical misrepresentation or absence or erasure. I also wonder too about audiences. They seem more savvy and that they want more too and aren't satisfied with the same old force-fed narratives. A hundred percent. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and there's so much variety now. And there's, you know, before you just had your channels and they've been growing over time, but now it's like, you can't create enough content. And so um, it's an explosion um, and it reaches every corner really, because you can, you can create whatever content you want to create and there you'll find an audience for it. Um, and then as that diversifies the audience, then the audience gets to say, well, I want more of this, which is what you're talking about, Tracy, which is not the force fed narrative that they've been getting and they're smarter. Thank you, everyone. Um, and also a little bit of acknowledgement too, I think about um, industry leaders like Sierra and Ellis who are in those spaces, um, similar to what Jennifer Padensky was talking about of, um, yeah, influencing the structure, really being at the top of their game. And that's where so much of the change happens as well. Coming from an educational background for so long, I remember fighting for representation in teachers, but then we forgot about the administration, for example, and those were who are making the decisions. And so really now seeing major changes, you know, especially 
in BIPOC communities for fighting for representation at those levels and administrative um, capacities. And it's so similar to, you know, this media space. And um, so when there is news, for example, of Bird going to Amazon or Taika Waititi pairing up with Sterling and, you know, executive producing reservation dogs, there's, um, there's some, yeah, interesting shifts happening there too about influencing the networks in that way. I mean, I think it's also a change in the mediascape because television used to be its own thing, right? Theatrical distribution used to be a separate thing. And now we just have an overarching screen culture and we have social media and things are bouncing and pinging off each other. So I would say that the landscape has changed and a small story can become a real big one overnight. Absolutely. All right. So Jamie um, sent us another audience question. Thank you for all of this building growth and inspiration. What programming would you all like to see? Also, how are you hoping to strengthen each other's work, which is so amazing? Does that question mean programming as in like programs or like shows? Is there? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna say we can interpret it um, since it comes coming from the audience. For my lens, I think about um, uh, just the stories we want to see in the world, but also where are they seen. But I think you can interpret it in the way that's most meaningful to you. I guess for me, um, I I think if it's programming like on the you know on platforms then I think that language is probably the most the next most important step I mean I think there's like it has it takes all the different things happening at once to I think to as a next collective step but language should be one of those things and even for those of us like myself who I am not a language speaker but I could um absolutely make a show in the language with the right resources and in the process learn learn my language but also beg not beg but uh ask the audience like they would any other film in a language they don't speak to just enjoy the story i think that's a little bit of a hurdle that if it I imagine that we could get there and, and it could feel like very watchable while also creating that space. And what Amalia was saying about um, the, like the, na the nationhood of those stories from those specific cultures that have a distinct language, we could then begin to really uh, achieve that narrative sovereignty through, through language. I can agree with that with net. Oh, sorry. That's okay, go ahead, Tracy. Oh, I think we see that with Netflix and the success of their international stories. The audiences are very much interested in um, hearing directly from the people in the language. And so subtitles are more and more common, I think, with the success of Squid Games, for example. It opens the door for all of these other productions to happen in the language. Yeah, I don't, I really, it's hard for me to understand why it hasn't happened already. Um, so um, I know, I know of some native um, filmmakers that have produced extremely high quality uh, content in the native language and they just don't get traction. Um, and I'm really ready for that to change. So, um, you know, we have taken on a little bit of that just it, creating our own content in our language just for our people because no one else is doing it you know so so we're doing it um but I, I really am hopeful that things will change on that front um and though so talking answering that question about programming that you would like to see um I would also love to see just for because I've been doing this on a small scale with OCO Voices of the Cherokee People, where we get to retell the history from our perspective, I would like to just go back and redo it all. So, so just like go back and do those 
Westerns from our perspective or, you know, um, historical um, narratives from our perspective. And so those are things that I'm working on a little bit that I would really love to, you start there, like, let's go back, let's take y'all way back here and do it from our perspective. And at the same time, moving forward with, you know, the more modern um, cinema that we, that we're seeing today. I'd love to see content that's not just for adults. I think that there's a gap, you know, there's like kids animation and then there's like blood quantum, right? So where's the in between, right? Where is the filmography for the tweens? You know, where are the shows for them? You know, how to make something cool for that generation that's looking to identify with something and so often looks outside of their own culture to for that coolness and that approval, right? So I think validating and naturalizing one's own language and culture and music, you know, and I think we see that in indigenous hip hop as being incredibly strong. So I think I'd like to see some kind of equivalent in, in something for the younger generation. I hope those are kids having fun. That sounded awesome. <laughs> I live next to a school, so they're informing my thinking all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the second half of the audience question was, and how are y'all hoping to strengthen one another's work? You go, Jen. So, oh, so I, I mean, I'm I'm up for you know even using this as, you know, a, a place to start and talk about how we can um, start collaborating. But one thing that is sort of, um, now that I have this physical space, a sound stage, um, it, we have um, virtual production or extended reality capabilities. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, but we have a giant LED wall, an LED ceiling, motion capture technology in our facility and it's a huge asset for our tribe and we're using it. We recreated Sequoia with the first language speaker and actor in a motion capture suit. We released that video last week and it's a really powerful tool for our tribe, but I would love to spread the wealth, you know, share the wealth. I would love to invite other teams um, to come utilize our space. And so I'm trying to figure out ways to do that. Um, you know, if it's that we're offering up the space for no cost um, for indigenous content creators to come in and use it, maybe, you know, once every month or something, you know, something, but I, we really do wanna share that space and look for ways to um, help uh, lift those indigenous voices. So that's something that I would put out there. You know, it would be fun uh, a global virtual trade show that was just for indigenous, like, you know, how any other trade show would be like AFM or whatever, um, but only all indigenous and you could go in and out of, you know, Zoom rooms and everything sort of live like this. And you go to people's booths. Like I've been to a trade show in COVID. Um, obviously it would be better if it was live. So let's dream about it being live, that it was a trade show where like Cherokee Film Office would have, you know, all of their services. And then we could start like building the economy together and people from all over, indigenous people from all over the world um, at a, you know, a trade show that travels every year. And it's like the biggest global market for indigenous knowledge sharing. And, you know, like just go back to how the traditional ways of, uh, you know, trading and networking and supporting and collaboration and co-production and all of those things. And uh, yeah, that's, I would, I would love that. That sounds cool. Yeah. There, there was a spark of that at the indigenous cinema stand at the European film market, right? Where that stand just, you know, just its existence. Again, people were just inspired walking by it because it was that, that sovereignty being enacted by there being a completely separate stand for indigenous cinema from all over the world. Um, I don't know what's happening with the stand. I don't know what's happening with the page that they used to have too, but I think that there, you know, there have been efforts and I would say not duplicating efforts is important. I think it's important to see what's happening over there and see if it can be reloaded or if those contacts can be lifted and, and transferred. 
So we have about 10 minutes before we turn it back over to Jamie to just walk us out and highlight upcoming industry day events. In this last 10 minutes, I'm hoping that each of you wouldn't mind sharing about what's on your plate, what's coming up, um, what's the exciting news on, in your world. Um, I am currently working on a, on a six part one hour limited series up here in Canada for, for a network called Crave, um, which is a, a streaming platform. And it is uh, a very, my, my biggest show so far, and it's been all encompassing, but it's called Little Bird right now. And it's a show about one, uh, one adoptee from the 60s scoop, her journey to reconnect with her family. And it's, uh, it's been a journey, but we are going into production in uh, this, the winter of 2022. And, um, and it's with APTN, our Aboriginal, People Tele uh, Aboriginal People's Television Network and Crave. And hopefully it will, it will come to audiences around the globe, I hope, um, yeah. And uh, I have another series on the air right now called Unsettled, um, which is also only up here in Canada, but that's 10 half hours. And it's, um, yeah, it takes place all in a First Nation about a woman who is forced to stay in her community after her husband loses all their money. And she has to move in with her mom that she only has recently connected back to. So that's an interesting story as well but for now that's it for me makes me want to figure out how to hack the system to have uh -huh. access <laughs> um also can you let everyone know where to find shine oh we're at um shine network.ca uh we're undergoing a rebrand because we have recently received our not-for-profit status and uh we are calling now turning into an institute so we really are a professional development um uh, and content space. And, you know, so far we've, we've mostly focused on, uh, de, uh, on offering courses and professional development, but I plan on, on growing it to do some very exciting things that address, um, creating safe spaces for indigenous women specifically in this industry, but also beyond that, um, changing policy and, you know, working as an ad on an advocacy level, um, in the screen-based industry shine network.ca thank you so much jennifer i saw you come off mute um jennifer i was gonna say you had mentioned um kind of and this was earlier talking about ways that we could move forward um getting more people we always say we want to get um indigenous and native people in every level of film and television including the boardroom so in front of the camera, behind the camera and in the boardroom. So um, that's not anything, the boardroom part of that is not part of um, any of our initiatives right now. I haven't seen very much out there that is working toward that um, other than just getting people in the industry and letting them work their way up. But if anybody knows of any sort of programming that's out there that specifically is working toward that, um, I would love to know about it because uh, I think that's really important as well. Um, on my plate. So on my original content side, um, we are currently wrapping up production on season seven of OCO. Um, and that will be released beginning the end of January. Uh, it's been incredibly difficult to do during the pandemic. Um, we hit it hard during that little break there and then the Delta variant came back. And so um, it's been delayed a little bit, but it will it will definitely um, premiere at the end of January. So that'll be wonderful. Um, and then we're also continuing to work on growing our original content team um, out of our studio. And so we're doing some really neat um, proof of concept ideas, utilizing the technology in our studio, like the Sequoia project is just one example, but we have some really neat other um, projects that would be first of its kind um, 
certainly for for um, indigenous film that I know of. So I'm really excited about that. And then just working on that next five year plan, that next strategy of how we're going to grow and keep this movement um, with Cherokee Nation Film Office and all of our initiatives. I need some success stories like like we're doing all of these initiatives and we have all of these things in place, but I really um, want to see something go all the way through an indigenous, you know, uh, 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 project that goes all the way through, you know, our programming. And then we have a, something we can show in a success story that wasn't funded, you know, by the Cherokee Nation. Thank you. And just to recap one more time, where can people find both the Cherokee Film Office and OCO? Cherokee.film is our website for the film office. And then OCO is, um, we're, and both of these, you can find us on social media. So um, anywhere you, you go for social media, you'll find Cherokee Nation Film Office or OCO TV. Um, and it's spelled O-S-I-Y-O dot TV. And uh, that's where we stream for free all of our uh, docu-series. So it's their 30 minute, uh, their 30 minute, shows but you can also watch them just as short documentaries so each person that we feature gets their own short documentary which is anywhere from six to eight minutes long i really loved watching everything from learning about uh sports to artists to history it's just such a great resource thank you we try to make sure there's something for everyone and we cover all the generations right on and amalia what's on your plate so we have the Native Cinema Showcase in its 20th edition. This time, for the second time, it's going virtual. So you'll find that through the NMAI website if you go to the schedule section, or if you just search Native Cinema Showcase. And there's going to be roundtables, and there's going to be a lot of films um, over, over a period of six days, November 12th to 18th. So that's going to be online. Um, the CLACP network has partnered with an NGO from uh, Catalan region of Spain to produce a new streaming platform that will offer free videos of a, a festival they have now of indigenous cinema that's just closing now called IndieFest. And it's called Mirada Nativa, like the native gaze. It's miradanativa.org. So that's a new development that happened last week. And we've got the Mother Tongue Film Festival that is reviewing submissions now and we will be again going in, in virtual on uh, February 17th to March 4th next year. And that's usually over uh, spans a few days before and after International Mother Language Day, which is February 21st. And I want to point out that this for us is one of the first events of this uh, UNESCO's decade of indigenous languages, which I'm sure will bring a lot of uh, indigenous language film to us all. Thank you. Just be sorry to interrupt, Tracy, but in yeah. answer to that question of how can we strengthen each other's work, I would be happy if both Amalia and Jennifer could send me stuff that I could put in my social media and just tell everybody what's going on with your, your organizations and festivals. I would be happy to, to shout it out and celebrate it and just like share it as much as possible. Um, that's, yeah, I just, I just need to get the content to share it. We'll do it and same for same for us. Thank you. And I'll just do a quick plug for our reciprocity project at Neotero, which is a new multimedia platform, which features indigenous made content and community driven stories. So we uh, are going to be premiering seven short films starting next month at the Hawaii International Film Festival with Justin Achong's story. Um, and then in the following months, uh, various festivals. Um, and then at Big Sky International Documentary Film Festival in February, you can see the full slate of seven films. So. Again, this was amazing. Thank you for your generosity of time and knowledge and spirit and just what a powerhouse of incredible indigenous women and lived experience and industry experience thank you so much everyone thank you and with that i'm going to pass it back over to jamie who will share with us oh 
Ashri's coming in for the, the goodbye. She enjoyed the panel with us all. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful and important conversation. Uh, Jennifer Loren, Amelia Cardova, Jennifer Kudemski, and Tracy Rector. We appreciate you all so much. And again, thank you for joining in for this combo. Um, tonight, we have our Drag Bingo networking event hosted by Josie Baker and Weird Alice. If you're registered, check out your email. You'll have your bingo cards in there. Um, if you haven't yet registered, we'll be sending out another round of bingo cards before the game, so it's not too late to join in. Um, tomorrow, we have a keynote speech by Jack Steele. We have a conversation on the intimacy, on intimacy coordination on set and the importance of having intimacy coordinators on your projects, um, which is a really, really great conversation. We have a special TikTok message from Brett Muswa, and we have some updates from the Indigenous Screen Office, as well as a really great conversation uh, with the creators, Sterling Harjo, uh, Debra Jacobs, and the Faro um, for a Reservation Dogs panel, which is really great, and you won't want to miss that tomorrow. So thank you all again for joining us, and uh, have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you, thank you Jamie. Thank you, Jennifer, and Jennifer and Amalia. Hello. Thank you to the team of Kim Theory as well. <laughs> yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Talk to my.